Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. It's a little bit of a long weekend. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for our weekly Friday Lunch and Learn. So today we have a special guest, Michael Manorino. He is going to talk about talent intelligence and hiring. So without further ado, uh, Michael, I will let you go ahead and share your screen. Hi, Pooja. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Let me. I think you're uh, on mute, Michael. Okay, how's that? Can you hear me now? Are you guys able to hear me? Uh, this is William. I can hear Michael. Okay, fantastic. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen and let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Okay, so what we have for you is part one of a two part discussion on talent intelligence. Um, today's part is really about um, talent intelligence for, for folks who have not been familiar with it. And I'm sure there's people on the call who are pretty familiar with it. Um, it's basically a new way that companies are using uh, to go and attract and try and hire the best possible talent uh, that's currently out there. So for today's, uh, you know, sharing discussion, we've prepared just a, a couple of quick topics, maybe about five or six slides, and then we can open this up to a, a more hopefully fruitful conversation to make your time uh, during this lunch and learn as, as uh, productive as possible. So we'll, we will uh, just go into a small, small blurb about uh, us, Ecutech, and then we will talk about uh, talent intelligence, the overview of it. Uh, I'll give you some information. Uh, most of this is all 2020 information. Uh, there's a little bit of information of post COVID as well, um, which could be useful to everybody on the call, but we'll, we'll, we'll jump into education and uh, some of the developer demand that we're even still seeing right now today. Um, we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of the process flows in talent intelligence and how talent intelligence is really now starting to shift itself and use artificial intelligence as well. Um, and then we will, of course, last but not least, uh, pop into who's hiring right now. Um, I'll share with some resources, uh, even some of the resources that we use um, to take a look at that. And then uh, hopefully um, you've liked it so much that we can come back in June and help you specifically with your branding and your marketing on the professional world to help you find you know, the job that you are looking for um, and put your best foot forward to uh, employers that are looking for that as well. So here's a super long and drawn out discussion about our company, Acutech. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's just a quick 30 second video, so I'll be quiet for just 30 seconds. Uh, just take a peek and then we can move on to the talent intelligence. All right, so as I mentioned, I'd make it brief and that's everything you need to know about us and our bio and uh, Ecutech. So um, when we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, when we talk about talent intelligence, what we're really talking about is the data associated with both companies that we refer to as employers and the candidates, which we refer to as the talent. And so you'll hear more of that vernacular in the industry. Um, as you put your ear to the ground and start, you know, really noticing what's happening around you as it relates to the way companies hire, um, you know, candidates around the world. And so when we talk about talent intelligence itself, we're talking about the application of data and the data is really related to uh, different companies. It's related to obviously uh, the talent that's currently out there. Um, it's related to different jobs that are currently out there. It's related to the competitors and what they're doing, the geographies that they're currently working in, the skill sets that they're looking for, the functions that they're looking for. 
And so the first thing that generally comes up when we start talking about talent intelligence is, oh, you mean HR tools? And we're like, not exactly. And so, so the definition, you know, uh, or the difference I should say between, um, you know, the people team or the HR team and talent intelligence is an easy way to look at it is the people team generally focuses on people who are currently in the uh, company itself. And then when we talk about talent intelligence, talent intelligence, you know, is really a, a tool and a system that's used at probably the business level to start making really informed business decisions um, for, you know, company owners, SVPs, C-level folks, things like that. And uh, it's really used by, you know, different departments. Obviously, you know, HR recruiting would, would be using it, but different department heads, department leads, hiring managers, you know, if you haven't had the opportunity to use uh, talent intelligence, yes, I would, you know, and you're a hiring manager, I would strongly, strongly encourage it. It probably makes your life, a, you know, a lot easier in a lot of ways. And the graph that's on this particular page, um, I, I put this out here just to help folks uh, on the call understand or on the video understand. Um, these were the top five attributes um, that companies wanted when they were using talent intelligence. And so on the far left-hand side, you know, one of the biggest things that employers used was basically a feasibility study um, in their current locations, or if they're trying to go into new locations, um, what they would find there, the type of resources that were there, the pay scale, scales that were there, the experience levels that were there, the types of education levels that were there, the colleges that, you know, and universities that happened to be in those areas. And ironically so, from a, from a, from a candidate perspective, from a talent perspective, you know, we tend to come in from the right side of the bar graph and we tend to look at, you know, what's the company name? How much are they paying? What are the skill sets that they're looking for? So there's a little bit of a gap between what employers are looking for and then what candidates or talent is generally looking for. So to, to boil it down and, and bring it a little closer to home for you, there's a, there's a ton of different talent intelligence sources that are out there right now. I shouldn't say ton, there's probably about maybe two dozen leading providers. And of those leading providers, there's probably about five or six that are, that are pretty far ahead of the pack um, that the rest of the pack is trying to catch up to. So some of the known players that you're probably familiar with, the LinkedIn's, uh, the Gartner's, the Gartner has a tool called Neuron. Um, IBM has a tool called Watson. Uh, there's a company that we like in particular that we've been working with and we work with, we work with all of these companies and we've um, you know, done behind the scenes looks uh, with all of these companies and MZs is, is, is one of the companies that we really like. We'll get into them a little bit more uh, a little bit later. But besides the actual uh, TI uh, service providers, what are they actually doing? Well, they're going out to every known social platform on the planet and they're extracting huge amounts of data. They're going to every known work platform on the planet and they're again, extracting huge amounts of data. So the LinkedIn's, the Twitter's, the GitHub's, the GitLab's, um, you know, all of those um, work platforms have just gold mines of different types of information, depending on what you're looking for. So let me just give you one small example and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue on. Um, in the GitHub world, if you are an architect or a developer and uh, you know, that's been your role and job title, what we can do today is we can go extract um, talent members in GitHub or GitLab, and we can see basically every check-in that you've done since your inception on that particular platform. Um, we can see how frequently they are, what the actual check-ins were, what you were doing, you know, are you reviewing code? Are you actually writing code? Are you checking in frequently? Are you deploying code to production? Are you doing QA on code? So, you know, what are you actually doing with your code base? So it's a, it's a super way to really cipher between folks who use the label of developer, but do different aspects of development. Um, what's really also pretty popular is government data. Now, the difference between social platforms and work platforms, and then when you compare government data, government data tends to lag a little bit behind 
um, but we use those um, as indicators for different elements within uh, the TI platforms. And then last but not least, the TI platforms, and some of you may have already known this, and some of this might be new to people, is they constantly uh, scrape uh, every, you know, a lot of the major sites out there to gain more intelligence about what companies are posting what roles in what geographies, you know what I mean, and things like that. So um, there's just a, you know, as you can see by how this is shaping up from the data side of things, when you're looking at, you know, four, five, six different platforms um, that provide, you know, just, you know, terabytes, even more petabytes of data, there is just a ton of data. And now that we have that data, you know what I mean? You have to kind of slice it and dice it in different ways. And then once you're slicing and dicing in different ways, you know, we're going to inject some artificial intelligence to do that slicing and dicing for us, you know, in ways that we can, you know, have outputs that are useful to us so the employer can actually hire the best possible candidate. And we'll get a little bit deeper to that in just a slide or two. I want to pivot over and talk about some of the things that we learned regarding talent intelligence as it relates to education and then as it relates also to developer demand. So on the left hand side of the screen is just a bar chart um, referring to education and how it relates to employers. And on the right hand side of the screen is just another chart identifying, you know, the demand in the developer space specifically. And this, this could be anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be developers. It could be any type of role, but I'm just using developers based on this group that we're currently talking with today. And so on the left hand side, jumping back into education, what we found most interesting in 2020, if you're holding a CS or an engineering degree, um, the most uh, in-demand degree right now happens to be a bachelor's degree. So if you have a CS, in, you know, or an engineering degree at the bachelor level, you're sitting in a pretty good position. And that pretty good position really says um, for the different colors of the bar chart, in case you can't read it, the yellow bar chart really represents employers that are uh, 10,000 employees or larger. And so at those types of organizations, they typically tend to have about 70% of their developer community holds a bachelor's degree. So those are, those are pretty favorable odds. And then, you know, as you go um, one graph over to the right and we look at our master's and doctorate degrees, you know, uh, companies of 10,000 employees or more, they typically have about 22% of their developer base um, that has a master's degree or a, a doctorate degree. So when you couple the bachelor's with master's and the doctorate degrees, it's about, at large companies, about 91% of their engineering or developer staff uh, members have degrees, which is great news for everybody on the call. On the right-hand side, switching over to the right-hand side, talking specifically about the developer roles, and these, there's only a couple roles here. I didn't obviously include everything. Um, for the probably the third or fourth year running in a row, the full stack developer gets everything. Um, so the full stack developer wins again. The full stack developer is the uh, you know, most in demand type of role that's currently out in the industry when we talk about the developer role itself. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the, the dwindling demand is the QA role. So I'm sure that's probably not a shock to a lot of people on the company or on the call. Um, as QA doesn't get a whole lot of love uh, in the developer world, as most of us already know. The irony to all of this is when we talk about, you know, the large companies, the employers with 10,000 employees or more who are typically looking 91% of the time for, you know, candidates with degrees or advanced degrees. Well, the Googles and the IBMs and the Apples in about the last six months lifted the requirement um, to have a degree to be in an engineering or developer role. So there's a little bit of a paradox and that paradox really comes from they weren't able to staff uh, the folks that they were looking for and that requirement of must have a degree softened a little bit more so they can actually uh, meet their staffing uh, plans that they had. Uh, for that year and this you know even parlays into 2020 as well. Switching gears on the salary uh, side of things, 
And again, this is by no means a detailed index of salaries. This is just a comparison, and I'll give you what the comparison is in just one second. Um, these roles that you're looking at on the left-hand side are developers worldwide by country. And on the right-hand side of the graph, what we're looking at specifically to this call are developers in California. And so um, on the left-hand side, and as I have highlighted in yellow, is these are an average of averages. So we're not really using this to say, well, in the United States, the average salary of a developer is 109,000. What we're really looking for here is the comparison between the United States and say like the number two country um, for salaries of developers is Australia and how you know this is used often is well so the US you know pays about 20% more than Australia and about 30% more than Canada just kidding than Canada um, by comparison and on the right hand side when we start looking at the breakdown of developers um, across the United States you know the highest metros that should come as no surprise to anybody are of course San Francisco, Seattle, and LA, which is great. And then the highest regions, which should come as no surprise uh, to anybody, are the West. And the West typically leads, you know, by a by a substantial amount of portion, at least 10% or more. Uh, in some cases, you know, 25% or more when compared to other locations around the uh, United States. And so why is that? Because that's where we have a lot of our tech giants. As you recall from the last slide, you know, tech giants are preferring um, people with uh, degrees over people without degrees. And then obviously the tech startups that, that take place in those regions. So um, what's going on now is a shift from just a talent intelligent tool to talent intelligence plus AI. So if you start thinking about it, if I'm a talent intelligence tool and I'm trying to scrape LinkedIn and LinkedIn, you know, advertises that they have 600 million records, um, you know, it gets a little tricky trying to sift through those records or, you know, trying to write, you know, different types of queries to go and find what you're looking for. And that's just one data source. So when you start coupling this with other types of data sources that have other types of attributes, as I was mentioning, you know, on the GitHub or the GitLabs, when we're looking at specific developer check-ins, you know, that data source is ginormous. And then trying to relate those two data sources together, other than just by the actual uh, human, the candidate itself, you know, could be very cumbersome. So what we've seen uh, in probably about the last six months, has been um, the introduction into AI into uh, talent intelligence. And so what I have for you here on this slide is just a, just a conceptual overview of you know, how AI is playing into talent intelligence. And I really wanna draw your attention to our, our numbers and our asterisk in purple um, circles. And so on the far left side, it starts with job requisitions from the employer side. But what's already going on in the background, as we kind of talked about before, is you have all these experiences that are going on on personal social media platforms that are being captured. You have all these experiences that are going on on professional um, social media platforms, as I mentioned, the Twitters, the LinkedIn's, things like that. And those are being collected about you in the background. And then you have all these interests and these experiences um, and then what we end up doing as a candidate is we see a job requisition of a location that we like or a, a role that we like, and we apply for it. And that's really the trigger that kicks things off. And then what happens behind the scene, as, as most of us know, um, our resume and our profile you know, in the artificial intelligence world starts to have a rating as it relates to a particular role. And so I'm going to jump to the next screen and just show you just a super high level um, of what it really looks like to an employer or a hiring manager when they're using an AI tool to go and find, you know, the top five, 10, three candidates that they want to talk to. And so what we have here is on the left hand side, and by the way, this is a snapshot of IBM Watson. So uh, some of the tools do it a little bit differently. 
Um, this is one of the ways that Watson does it. So there was a role, um, I think this was a sales role on the left-hand side, and they had somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,700 applicants. And so what they do is they bucketize all their applicants in you know, any percentage you want, but in this case, they use 10% increments. And, they, um, and with each of those increments, they start identifying very key attributes and they prioritize uh, those attributes depending on what the hiring manager is looking for or what the company is looking for um, and things like that. And so in this particular case, um, you know, 3,700 or something around that number applied for this role. And in the top, you know, uh, 10%, there was only 1% of the candidates that were able to meet the criteria for the top 1%. And on the right hand side is just a little kind of snippet to give you an identification of just a couple attributes that they're looking for. Um, so in this case, you know, it was really important uh, for the hire, you know, for this particular role that was open to know, you know, where did the resource last work? Um, you know, what was the resources, you know, education levels? Um, what was their actual grade point average in those, in that education level? So, you know, these attributes have now, you know, grown in an end by end fashion. Here's just a couple small attributes associated with this one role, and there are hundreds of attributes right now. And as you know, hiring leaders, you can prioritize different attributes. So a huge attribute right now uh, going on in the industry, um, in case you're not aware, is diversity. So diversity is a very, very big attribute you know, that tends to now bubble up to the top. Most people talk diversity, but now there's AI tools that actually help us with that. Um, if we're looking for um, different types of aspects of a candidate themselves, other than their skill level or what you know university they came from. Switching gears to uh, what's happening before and after uh, COVID-19 is the unemployment snapshot. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with you know all the news and buzz that's going around um, in the employment sector today where we were hovering somewhere in the three and a half to 4% uh, nationwide of all labor. And that statistic has pretty much quadrupled in the last two months. Now the shining array of light in all of this is the demand in the IT sector has maybe gone up, you know, um, a very small percent, not a very small percent, but a smaller percent in relationship to what's happening in the national sector of all jobs. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. As you know, um, we're, we're looking at technology um, to help us uh, during these times. Um, we're, we're looking at technology for opportunities to service you know, the globe uh, at large during these times. We're looking for technology to create better ways where people can work obviously remotely and people can work uh, via mobile, uh, where they don't have to be confined to an office. Um, and as, as you know, folks have been following along, you know, with the news on this, there's a whole bunch of companies, you know, most of them are tech giants, but some of them aren't, that are coming forward today and that are saying like, huh, this work from home thing, you know, the Twitters of the world said, we're going to keep that forever. You know, the Googles and the Facebooks um, of the world have said like, we're gonna continue that at a minimum through the end of this year. And then going forward, you know, um, with the squares and the Jack Dorseys of the world, you know, they're like, we're gonna have this going forward as a part of our arsenal in the future. So there are, you know, opportunities now for folks to work for, you know, I would say almost any company, it doesn't necessarily have to be just in your geography, um, that are popping up and, and, you know, we see that trend just continuing, you know, at just a mad pace uh, going on right now. Now, you know, at the end of COVID-19, will some of those things change? Possibly, possibly, but we don't know the effects right now, but remote working and being able to do, you know, a, a technical job remote is really nothing new. I mean, you know, for some of us that have been in the industry a little bit longer, this stuff has been going on 10, 15, 20 years easily. Um, but now it's just taking, you know, uh, a different shape based on the pandemic that's going on right now. And I think it's going to be here to stay for a long time. 
who's hiring today and what are the layoff situations? I have a, a bunch of resources um, that we have created here for you um, in this particular uh, Lunch and Learn on the who's hiring. So um, if, for those of you who are on LinkedIn, you might have seen this. LinkedIn has a hashtag hiring now and they update it at a minimum every week. And so um, I have that on the left-hand side. We're not gonna jump into it right now, but they really give you a pretty good breakdown. And I say pretty good because it's not just tech jobs, it's all jobs. Um, uh, LinkedIn of what companies are hiring. So if you have a, a, a preference or a disposition to try and join a company that you support or that you really like, that's an excellent resource to go and hit up. Um, again, hashtag uh, hiring now, and they update it, you know, pretty regularly. And this is updated by some of the editors at LinkedIn. So um, they didn't, you know, offload this task to just anybody. On the right hand side, um, there's a bunch of really good res resources. And especially if you've been impacted by COVID-19, um, there's a lot of resources that get circulated and they come across, you know, our vision uh, very frequently. Um, and so one of the probably more prevalent ones is this resource uh, called layoffs.fyi. And so layoffs.fyi, and there's been lists that get circulated that you opt into um, if you want to um, share your information and, you know, share what recruiters are really looking at. Because, you know, when you're talking about or employers are really looking at um, when they're trying to hire talent, um, a new resource that is totally available to us has been these lists that get created by either different companies or they get created by different movements that happen um, of all these, you know, of all this talent that was currently employed at company X or Y or Z that has been impacted that's currently out there looking. So it's just another avenue um, to look for really good resources or if you're, you know, a, a candidate that has been recently let go, you know, just know that this is a great place um, that a lot of internal companies as well as, you know, external um, recruiting companies really go and look for candidates that are looking for roles today. Um, one of the uh, talent intelligent providers that we talked about early on was this company, MZ, E-M-S-I. So MZ is really known as MZ Data. And so MZ Data, um, they give us a, a whole bunch of resources right now for free um, that, that'll end at some point when COVID ends. But right now they have two that are, that are something that I would recommend. Um, they're economic modeling uh, resource. And then probably more important for some of the folks on the call that are looking, their uh, resume optimizer. And so again, they're offering those things for free. And then if you wanna you know, stay in tune with what's going on you know, in the economy, um, a pretty good resource for that is uh, trading economics. Well, um, I tried to keep this to the time that we have. So hopefully this was uh, useful everybody, uh, for everybody on the call. Um, we'll, we'll open this up in just a second for Q&A. Uh, my, my business partner uh, is also on the call. He's based out of London. Um, good thing he's not a drinker or having a beer right now. And, uh, <laughs> but that's allowable seeing it's Friday night in London. Um, but uh, in part two, um, we're gonna come back and share uh, some personal branding and marketing. And, and so again, um, Mark, who's also on the call, uh, my business partner, um, he's, a, he's a power user of LinkedIn. His network is about uh, 20 plus thousand, 22,000. Uh, connections there. Uh, he's been doing some some great things, obviously not with just LinkedIn, but with a whole plethora of TI tools. And I uh, just want to help, you know, anybody that's out there, if you're looking for people or if you're, you yourself are looking for roles, we're here to help you in just any way we can. I hope some of the information we shared with you today has been helpful. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, let's go ahead and just open up the you know, the lunch and learn for any type of, you know, thank, thank you so much, discussion. Michael. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat um, from Jamar and from me. So if you could maybe answer those.
Okay, so on the chat, the first question that we see is, how are you seeing remote work affect how companies are hiring and are companies becoming less geosensitive, impact to salaries? You know, yeah, very good question. Uh, we are seeing, in fact, today alone, um, I read a super interesting article of the postings. So the posting types have changed a little bit. So in the past, we were looking at posting types. And as I showed you earlier in the presentation, the number one aspect that companies were looking for were location-based. So 91% of the time when employers engage talent intelligence, um, they were looking to do feasibility studies on location. Um, I read an article today um, that came out that said 37% of the current postings are for remote working. So that spike is about three, maybe four X of what we were seeing in the industry pre-COVID. You know, you would maybe see five at a high season, you maybe see 10% of the time people were looking for remote workers. So it quadrupling almost in the last uh, two months is a huge, huge shift. Um, so there is a little bit of specific city uh, geosensitivity going on, but what, what is also gonna be something that's gonna come up is if you think about it, um, maybe even the way uh, large organizations structure like um, cloud offerings, um, regionally, uh, speaking, when, when we relate to geographically, there might be some things that we see in the very near future of like time zone based stuff, you know, so we might see, you know, like a, a job opportunity that might get posted, you know, quote unquote, to like the Americas, instead of just getting posted to like San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. So now you're opening up that candidacy, not just to, you know, a specific city of San Francisco, but now you're opening up to everything in North America, everything in South America. So I think we're going to start to see amazing qualified candidates, you know what I mean, that work in different countries and different cities and different aspects. So uh, kind of interesting. Um, we haven't seen quite an impact to salaries yet. Um, you know, the base salary. Now, what we do see impacts of, you know, sign-on bon bonuses are, are, are pretty much obsolete. Um, besides sign-on bonuses, um, you know, depending on the organization that you're, that you're talking about, you know, the added frills um, that come with different types of job offers, depending on what level we're talking about in a job offer, those start to dwindle a little bit. So there are impacts um, to salaries, you know, is this going to change, you know, even more going forward? We don't know. Our hunch is salaries may come down. Um, does that, does that, you know, capture uh, some of that question, the spirit of that question and answering it? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Right on. Uh, the next question we have is how do the AI attributes get assigned and sorted? And also, um, Will your company also work in educating companies about effectively remote working? <laughs> so, um, well, let me interject real quick. So, one of the AI was, you know, you meant you kind of touched upon that. So, it was like, you know, what are some of those attributes, and you know, how do people use them, and things like that, um, in in that sense. And then the educating workers. It seems like a lot of companies, like for example, our sisters, who's at AT and T, um, are like very anti work from home, even though you know, now obviously it's forced upon. So now that people just have to do it, what kind of happens in the future? Does a company like yours kind of start educating that, okay, well, you know, this can extend and how to kind of manage it better instead of that blanket. No, you can't work from home unless you really have to, you know, because your child is sick type of. So we, we've had, just to answer it directly, we've had those uh, discussions internally. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we launched and so the interest has been ginormous and that is a question, believe it or not, that we've gotten like two or three times already. <laughs> so the answer is like, hi, um, you might want to pivot just a little and teach people about remote working and especially Michael, since you've been doing it for about 20 years, um, you know, you probably have a lot of whole bunch of good tidbits. I really, just to answer your question from a UCI perspective, I really appreciated um, the lunch and learn last week, I think it was last week, right? Uh, it's blurry this week for me. 
um, <laughs> last week about, you know, a lot of the insights and tips that they had to offer when you're working remotely. I mean, because, you know, it, it's in some cases you might have, like, let's take example, pets at home or kids at home, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, people will tolerate so much, especially during a pandemic. But, you know, as this starts to hopefully go away soon, Right. That's not going to be tolerated that often. Or if you're in a, you know, a multi-person meeting and, you know, your kid's running around crying in diapers and, or your dog's barking, right? I yeah. think that's going to irritate people a lot. So to answer your question in short, we haven't developed a package for that. Um, sounds like we probably should look into that a little bit closer. <laughs> um, yeah, just to, hi, everybody from uh, cold England over here. Uh, just to expand on Mike's comment there, it, it, yeah, I mean, it is something we, we will be working on, um, Pooja, because it, it is something that a lot of companies uh, require right now. Most companies have been thrown into working remotely um, due to COVID-19, obviously. So um, they're, they're, they've had to adapt very quickly. Um, but, you know, many companies don't have the the HR policies in place for um, remote workers um, and there's there's you, you know there's a long list uh, of items um, uh, that 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 are related to having a real truly um, um, established remote working setup um, particularly for enterprise businesses right yes um, and I mean so last week's conversation about COVID the you know one uh, question that was asked or presented was you know, kind of dealing with um, if somebody's in their bedroom, is that like acceptable in a Zoom call, like going forward, like sure in the short run and pandemic times it is, but long run, if that's uncomfortable for a party, you know, do you have to say you have to have a Zoom background up and kind of what is that etiquette for companies going forward for sure? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, um, Michael and I were also um, talk talking recently about, um, VR platforms as well that that, that are also um, gaining uh, a lot of popularity um, due to the current you know current COVID nineteen. Um, so so you know we see that as as being um, another uh, another really rapidly developed technology. We already had VR and AR, but but to now have companies uh, and there is a company we we've come across that are offering their platform free, which we can share with you um and so so it's it's really yeah you know that just at the the start of transforming how people live and work you know and 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 that's going to continue for, for, for many more months but what's exciting about it is how many companies are embracing it and how technology is just playing such a key role in 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 how it's developing Uh, yeah, and then there, there's that AI question that I had also. Um, I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, the attributes. Oh boy, they don't get assigned. So remember, what it, what is AI doing, right? It, we're not writing queries about this. We're letting it crawl the data to kind of, you know, give us impressions of what sort of signals are coming through the data. So that's why the attribute list is doing this. It's just growing bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, it's been it's been an eye opener. And you got to realize, the AI piece of TI has honestly only come on in maybe like the last three to six months. I mean, I mean, good AI, right? And so we're only going to see that grow more and more and more. Because think about the data sets, right? We're no longer writing rules or policies. There's no rules engine here. We're just saying like, crawl the data, give me impressions of you know the signals that are coming in those that data and now i can start to you know use those attributes in my scoring when i'm looking for a particular role it is it's it's just amazing i mean i'm enthralled with this maybe we can give a, a discussion about this in the future because i could talk about it for a very long time but the short of it is nope it's not well, attributes that are rising happens when, uh, say again uh, uh so i guess what happens like when you have also merging that with like okay well we need more women in the workforce but if you're you know if you're cr crawling and the ai is kind of picking up well it's all just male dominated from specific nationalities or things like that then how do you pair that ai data with okay well we still need like certain well, sure. small business owners minority owners or things like that right like 
No, but so think about how that would work with just one data source, like on a LinkedIn, 600 million records, right? So if your number one attribute is diversity, and if we're talking diversity and we're really saying gender, which is a function of diversity, right? Um, right. Then, you, then you're like, I only want the candidates, <laughs> you know what I mean, of this attribute to equal this, you know what I mean? Or yeah. let's make this, the, yeah, that's what's happening. That's literally what's happening. So yeah, it's not going to be so as hard to to say what you're looking for now to fulfill it. Obviously, that's still a, a challenge. Period. Right? Okay. Yeah. Does that does that answer that a little bit? Kind of. I mean, yeah. Maybe uh, maybe the next topic or something. But, okay. All right. Uh, unless someone else is interested, then we can talk about it later. Um, and Jason King also has a question about up, uh, you know, worker contract to hire and. A this is a very timely uh, question for Mark and I. Um, you know, so as we started, we, uh, we, we, only, we honestly only hit, you know, a very small number of companies that, that were in our network, right? And so um, uh, one of the companies called us about an hour ago and said, hey, um, I've got a plethora of contract workers. Can you help us? And we're like, of course. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's uh, you know, one of the areas that we work in. So I think we're going to see an explosion probably, you know, in this place as companies start to figure out, you know, what their employee base uh, should really look like, but then they need to augment um, in the interim to fulfill very specific things. So uh, the answer to that question, and the question for folks who aren't, who can't read the chat is, you know, we're being asked, you know, are you seeing an uptick in domestic temp work hiring uh, and positions or contract to hire or contract? And the, the short answer is yes. Uh, I yeah, it's very industry up. specific. What's that? Yeah, just, sorry, just to add to that, I mean, it, you know, it's very industry, you know, what, what obviously what we're seeing is, is a, a huge upturn in demand in specific industries, uh, the medical sector being one of one of them, um, logistics, but obviously a huge downturn in um, tourism, travel, hospitality, right? Um, so that 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 that's really where there, there's some 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 huge gaps um but as mike was 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 just um um talking through earlier the you know the the, the technology skills uh, across uh, a lot of industries although there have been, been some big big layoffs uh, as well with some of the big uh, big tech tech companies um but but generally it's in, in pretty good good shape across the tech sector uh, my follow-up to that, uh, Jason's question would be, uh, in California, I don't remember the name of the law, but um, earlier this year, they had that, I, I believe, AB5 or something, where it really messed with this contract worker situation. So do you, do you have any idea of kind of how the legal ramifications of now companies trying to hire contractors, but according to law, it's not what they should be doing? Um, or how you know how that gets affected? Yeah, I I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it personally, um, Pooja. But like especially during this time, I did see a guy yesterday open his closed beer and drink it right outside the store that he picked it up from. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, <laughs> you yeah. know. So stuff is relaxing a little yeah. bit. You know what I mean? Is it going to stay like that? No. <laughs> yeah. So to answer your short, no, I have, we haven't seen that specifically, but I, I'm, I'm sure we're going to run into that. I mean, the, the, yep, definitely. Good, good question. And it'll be one to watch in, in the coming weeks and months, because I hear what you're saying. There are some challenges when we talk about contracts and contract to hire. Right. Yeah. With all the Ubers and, um, you know, dance totally. teachers and things like that. And it's like, well, if you can't really make your payroll, um, and have someone on full time, but you would want them to teach a class still. Now, how does that affect with this new law that's in place? And yeah, this is an interesting marketplace. And I guess if it's just not being enforced, maybe. Then. Question. Um, and then William has a question about uh, talent intelligence software and resumes. And I think that's something more you're going to tackle next session, right? We are. So uh, great question. Um, uh, yes, 
lots of things that you can do. So let me just give you one anecdotal story and then I'll be quiet. Um, so we were, we were looking for a, a senior developer in the Bay Area and talking to, you know, chatting with a candidate. And I'm like, hmm, something doesn't feel right. Let's go look at their check-ins on uh, GitHub. And remember, you know, so you're having conversations. Hopefully people are honest in their conversations as much as they can be. Oh yeah, I do it all. And I'm like, why are there no check-ins in your GitHub for the past three months? Uh, 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 and how come when I look at your <laughs> GitHub account, it looks like you're looking at everybody else's stuff, but you aren't specifically touching files to check them in that you've written. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 so yeah, the, the, there are a lot of things you can do depending on the type of role that you're looking for that I would say, yeah, and we will share, you know, some of those, uh, attributes, you know, in our part two, but yeah, there, there, there is quite a bit. Um, so the, uh, the, the Friday night posts, even on your social platforms, you might want to be careful now going forward. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh no so William I um is that I don't know if you want to chime in and uh, if there was anything else or if you if you that will be just addressed in part two um we'll just open this up if anyone else has any other questions uh Michael thank you so much for talking about this topic and we look forward to your next one <laughs> No, thanks everybody and thank thank you for having us. It's been our pleasure.